full name and what is your Hamula? Fred Aziz Harb, Al Hamula Dar Yusuf, and I'm from the Harb family, the branch. When and where were you born? I was born in Ramallah, my beloved city. When? Oh, I was born in uh, uh, 117, 1938. Uh, please state your mother and father's full names. Uh, maiden name or regular name? Okay, my mother is Aziza Harb, and my father is Aziz Harb. <laughs> you could laugh at that. <laughs> Oh my God. My parents, for uh, my grandparents, for my mother, is uh, they are from Nasrallah family, Nasrallah family, which is in Dar Shaheen. And, uh, and my father's family, uh, they're, they're Harb, uh, exactly. His father was uh, Iskandar, his name. Iskandar uh, Harb, but they died long time ago, and they're a Harb too, so. But he, he, he was an orphan when he was born. He didn't have no father, no mother, no brothers, no sisters. So my aunt raised him as a baby, you know? That's how my father, when he was born. Well, actually, if I say he was working, partially he was working uh, with uh, the British uh, Marcas. It was in Ramallah, and he used to be the cook for them for a while because they were, you know, they were taking care of Palestine and Ramallah, the British soldiers, you know. And for a while, then he quit. And, he, had, he happened to inherit some property, so a few stores rented, and, uh, uh, and we lived above these stores when we were kids. And we, he raised a family of close to 14 people living in the same house above the stores. And uh, he really was, uh, you know, from the collecting the rent and everything, he used to sometimes use the trade uh, procedure by giving somebody, we used to have a dry figs coming in from our fields, from the people that uh, maintain it and they bring the kid, the, the figs. So we store it in, a, in an amber, big container made of wood or something. And then uh, somebody comes and he uh, buys the whole thing, you know. And that's some money that uh, comes to my father. And uh, with the rent, and he manages, he manages, I mean, to support the family. When they buy things, the, uh, they use the barter trade. They give him some, uh, they give that, uh, the, the man who, who sells kamah uh, and tahin, you know what, what I mean? He, maybe he gives them dry figs and he gets tahin, you know. That's what they do in the old days sometimes. Or they get oil, t tanks of oil, you know, not, not bottle of oil, like olive oil. And they get the cheese and they get pickles for a long period of time. They make it on, uh, with their hands, you know. Can you talk a bit more about uh, the British control and how you lived through Well, the British control, they were there, I think, it's just like uh, uh, zero, uh, zero from, uh, from the left, you know. They were they're just there, they occupied the, the hotel down there, uh, a few of them, and uh, finally they, uh, they took off and they went back to England, I think. They were not needed anymore, yeah. And what did your mother do for a living? Was housewife, really. She took care of the kids. She had about, uh, let's see, four kids and three, about seven. You know, I have to raise them. Do you have any personal memories of your grandparents? Not really. My grandparents, for from my father's side, I don't know them, really. I didn't because 
they died probably even after he was born, you know. Uh, there's no way he could uh, get married. But even though he got married early, uh, but still uh, early, he didn't have any kids yet when he was 12 years old. <laughs> so that's uh, so what But my, uh, on my mother's side, I used to go and visit my grandmother and grandfather. They used to have, they're from the Nasrallah family, Dar Shaheen. And uh, they were living up in the, near the Idaa, the, uh, the best location in, in Detroit, in, in, in Ramallah, you know. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, that's what happened there. And uh, I used to go down there. She used to plant Ascadinia. My grandma, she was a hell of a nice lady, you know, nice. And she loves me because I was a young, young kid and go there and visit them all the time. And she gives me, they used to grow lettuce, and they used to grow like Ascadinia in the tree. I used to pick it sometimes and eat it. And they were nice, nice people. She lived with her, uh, another daughter that he lost her husband, and uh, a granddaughter to, together in that uh, big house. And uh, then, you know, that's what happened. Most memorable stories you heard from your grandparents. Excuse me. Stories that you've heard from your grandparents. Oh, from my grandparents, they were old, really. It's, they, they didn't have no story really because they were kind. I I go down there, hi, Habibi, and all that. They were good. And uh, what do you like to have? And you know, they used to have a field in front of the house. They used to plant it, vegetables and all that, and lettuce and tomatoes and what have. And uh, my grandmother, she used to be short, and you know she goes and takes care of the garden. But my grandfather, he uh, through, through my mother's side, he was, you know, he he was bent over too much. You know, he goes came with that. Why? Because he used to carry stones, stones for building. You know, carry it on his back. You know, so that's what's happened. Working hard, they worked hard, and uh, she, uh, their daughter, uh, she, my mother, she, she got married to my father. She was 14 years old. Yeah. And uh, actually, uh, my grand, uh, my sitto, hey, the father, the mother of my, my father's side, she wanted him to get married, right away. Why? Because there is a reason. Because the property we have is for my great grandfather. And it's supposed to be divided equally in Ramallah between my father and uh, the other one is called uh, uh, Al Khuri Yusuf. You know, he's from another faction of the family, you know. And so he was, my father was going to be, he, he was going to put him in a institution out in Jerusalem, so he'll be diminishing so that he doesn't have to worry about his share. But my, my grandmother, um, it's not grandmother, really, she, the one who took care of my father, and she said, I want to get you married right now so that you'll get a share of the property. So even though the share was minimal compared to the other guy who, who, who uh, he had more kids, and he wrote them on a piece of paper and stamps and uh, everything that you take this piece and that piece. My father takes uh, the the crumb of the of the of the property, like a teen and a house. That's a well back here. There's a lot of land and everything, and a lot of property. It was to the priest, the father, uh, father. Uh, 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 Abu Abu George George his son was a priest too. They were here in in Ramallah during the, but they finally migrated. They came back to America. What traditions did you practice while growing up, and do you still practice the same traditions? What things? Traditions. Oh. What traditions did you practice while growing up? 
Well, we, I don't think we have any traditions. It's just a tradition is we, uh, we start going to school and walking to school and come back at dinner time, walking back home. And uh, after we eat, uh, we go back to school walking. It was about maybe mile, mile and a half, you know, the distance between the friends' boys' school and the, uh, the Greek Orthodox Church, because our house was right next to the church, the Greek Orthodox Church, down in the Old Ramallah, you know. And I used to walk it myself because I was put, I was the only one to finish education from my brothers and sisters. And the guy who helped me do that, uh, Aziz Shaheen, I don't know if you, if you remember him, he's the one who uh, helped create a hospital here. He, he gives uh, money to the university. He, you know, he was very, uh, very, uh, uh, he was wealthy and he really helped all kinds of organizations with his money, you know. He wasn't selfish or anything like that. So he used to teach six, seven students at uh, the university, a friend's boys' school. And he used to pay the tuition. So when somebody goes, he goes and gets another one, you know. So he came to the government school where I used to go, you know. He asked the teacher, he says, who you get a good student you get here in the fourth grade? She said, well, he looked at the teacher and says, oh, well, one guy by the name of Fred Harb. He says, oh, yeah? Oh, uh, I, I, he, uh, the teacher told him who I am and Ibn who's my father and mother. And uh, he says, oh yeah, I know, I know Fred Har because his mother is uh, my cousin, you know, from the Dar Shaheen, you know. So he says, well, he came to the house, talked to my mother, he says, I want to go and take Fred for Ed to uh, list him into the Friends Boys School. And I stayed there all these years till I graduated on the fourth, uh, the four, you know, four years after the high school, you know. I graduated from there, and after that, I decided to come to the United States to, uh, for my uh, higher education. So I did. My brother was living here alone, and so he made the paperwork, and I got a scholarship, and I started to go to school at Twain State University in Michigan, in Detroit. Oh, well, it's an old house, and it's, it got like a basement, under, under the first floor, you know. And we used to go cooking there and eat down there, you know. It wasn't like this, or you know, there's just rough walls and everything, and, and you know how they used to paint the ceilings and everything. They spray it with a sheet, it's called the sheet, white compound with water, they put in pumps and they pump it into the walls. and, and the, and the ceilings, you know. And she, she lived there, and we lived there, and uh, that's about it. And we, used, we have a big place upstairs. We used to sleep, a lot of people there. Uh, there's a bed. We, at, at one time, it used to be 14 people in that house. You know, it used to be my father, my mother, and uh, the four children, and the three girls, and my sister-in-law, because one of the brothers, he got married to her, and then she started having kids. She had about three kids, three boys, and they're all living in the same house. <laughs> uh, because we used to, in hot hasira al ar sometimes, they get a little bed, uh, not too thick or anything, and go and sleep on the floors. And then when we finish, we'll just roll the hasira, put it on the side, and we take the bed out, and that's it. But we lived a good life. It was beautiful life, I'll tell you. But uh, we, the, we had a house right next to the Greek Orthodox Church. So we sold it. We sold it when my sister was last to come to the United States. And she sold it for $50,000 because it got stores all around and the living areas on top, you know. We, they, they, we built, my father built two more rooms for sleeping rooms uh, on top of uh, the stores, you know. 
So anyhow, uh, the guy who bought it, uh, he thought he's gonna really develop it and all that, you know, but apparently he failed in all aspects. He, <coughs> the church came, they won it. They won it because they built some stores over there, beautiful modern, and they figured they'll take that piece of land and they expand their stores all the way in. They, 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 they make it look good in that area. Uh, the, uh, down in uh, proper Ramallah, down by the church. So, uh, uh, what I'm going to say is, uh, they, uh, uh, what did he do? Uh, that, that guy, the church came to him and told him, well, we'll give you half a million dollars. He said, no way, I want a million dollars. Well, he said, no, we're not going to pay a million dollars for that piece of land, because they were going to demolish the house and build that high rise, you know, two, three story building. So, and then he says, I, when I, I came to the convention last four years, I want to stop there and talk to him. He says, well, what I'm going to do, it was, half of it was uh, collapse because the church, they built a big wall for the, their project over there. But from that wall, half of the house, it's an old house with clay roof and all that, you know, Hubbard, you know. Uh, it's collapsed. So uh, he said, I'm going to take the whole thing out and build a high rise here. And I said, okay, good, good work. Good. And uh, finally, when I came here, I asked, and what happened, I went to visit that building. It was kharab. It was really devastated. The windows are uh, uh, busted, and, and uh, the, the bricks are uh, deteriorated. And, he closed his store. He used to have a little vegetable store, which uh, it, it really, it wasn't good product. It was old and withered and bad. So he was sitting with old people down there, and he closed the store because I don't think he has any vegetables no more. So they told me, uh, the, the, the church paid him half a million. He doesn't want it. He wants a million. I said, I know that. So I hollered them and said, listen, because he went to develop it and raise and demolish that house and raise it, the municipality stopped him. He said, you can't do that. No way you're going to build over there and demolish that old building. No way. But the church could, could do it if they want to, you know, to modernize it, you know. So how you can't? He's sitting down there. Uncle Tella, you better go and see what the... Uh, Church could pay you for it so that it could be useful. You could make $450,000. What's wrong with that? You only paid $50,000 for it. And Sarit Hajali, they were laughing at him, these old uh, people sitting around him. So and I left him as is. So it's still the, it's the worst scene in that, uh, in that area now. It's terrible. I'd like to see it demolished myself, really. Yes, I was 17 years old when I graduated and migrated to America. Yeah, I used to sleep on the floor. <laughs> As a child growing up in Ramallah, what did you do for fun? For fun? <laughs> There's no fun. We ain't got no toys and go spend some money on toys and everything. We used to, when they grow up a little bit, we used to play soccer ball on, on the roof there. You know, we, they used to make us balls out of uh, sharai to put together and, you know, and I used to kick it all over, just like soccer, you know. That's about it. Then for, uh, we used to take the bicycle, bicycle rim, and hit it with a stick and follow it. <laughs> That's a toy, you know. And then we used to play, uh, what do you call it, tak, takawigri. You know, you take that little thing, uh, sharp here, and you take a stick, and it lands on a stone, so it'll be like this. You tick, bang, and you hit it where it goes, you know. It's called takka wigri. Yani, tukka and ujri wara. <laughs> you like that, huh? Be able to? Travel easily from village to village back then. No, we, we never went outside Ramallah, actually, really. 
the, the, the only time we went sometimes is uh, away from Ramallah. There were, we used to have uh, fig trees, about 29 acres of figs. We used to go and we, we lease them to the people who live around there, you know, that take care of it and they take it, they dry it so they want it, it, it becomes contained, dry figs. They load it and they bring it to our house. We'll put it in a big, uh, big uh, container made out of wood so that when it's filled, when the season is gone, some people, they used to come and buy the whole thing and manufacture whatever they want. Usually they, the Yehud did buy it for, from us. And they manufacture it and they, they make the money. <laughs> Talk a bit more about the non-Yehud scandal just to... Huh? Talk a bit more about the Yehud's scandal to buy the figs from you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, who? The Arabs, then they're not going to find it. So the, uh, the, the, the Yehud, they were, you know, they, they, uh, they're uh, smart. They, they go, they manufacture it, they package it, and uh, they sell it in the stores and everything. They make money. When they, when they buy the figs from us, they don't pay nothing. Maybe um, the whole kilo, maybe, they don't pay about five pennies for it, you know? Because it's, it'll be big, I mean, it's high. I used to go and climb over there, go and walk on it so that in the, in the, uh, push it down a little bit, you know? What is one of your most vivid memories of Ramallah growing up here? Here now? I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I was devastated, you know, especially when I, I go up on the table of the roof and look around the, all around. It's nothing but old, high-rise buildings. No land, no, no swimming pools, no uh, uh, streets. They're all narrow and all that. It's, it's, it's phenomenal. It's uh, beautiful. But where the hell the people are going to go? Put them in tents? And these people here in Ramallah, they all, I think, they're all well-to-do. They got money. That's why they build these homes, they build these, uh, uh, I don't know where they get the money from, but they do. That's all they talk, in the millions, these guys who live here. I wish I did live here, I didn't go back to stay in America. I could have been a multimillionaire now, you know, <laughs> building and buying and selling and cheating and... <laughs> yeah. Growing up there? Here, in Ramallah. Like, do you have any important memories that you remember or any? Memories when I was in the United States? No, when you were here. When I was here? No, we have no memories at all. We were, it was a simple life and people live, lived together. They were friends and playing outside in the field with balls and all that. And that's, it was, I mean, it was a pleasant life, really. We enjoyed our life there, even though we didn't have too much to eat and too much to dress and all that, you know. Uh, still, it was a very pleasant place to live, weather-wise and uh, raising the kids uh, uh, correctly and all that. We have no crime, no nothing, and it was a beautiful uh, place to live at, really. The weather was great, because it's built from on about what? Mountains, mountainous. <clears throat> when the Arab-Israeli conflict began, what were some of the immediate changes you experienced living in Ramallah? The experience, we, we created uh, uh, Haras Watani. Uh, we supplied them with guns. We built uh, these uh, big ground uh, buildings. They go up there and they, they could see the incoming people or something. Like a guard house, you know. Yeah, and, uh, and one time, if I remember, I shouldn't even say that on, on the air. Uh, some, uh, I better not say that. A group of Jewish soldiers, they came in close to Ramallah and the Ramallah boys, because we used to have recruited some boys, you know, young men with, with uh, bullets and guns and everything. That's the municipality of Ramallah. So they went there, Hawatuhin, 
you know, around, and, and, and they killed most of them. And then they, they brought some bodies to Ramallah to expose them to the public, you know. Which they should have done that, but you know how it is. They, they were bitter about the whole situation, and, and just to inspire that, they want to show us that they, they were, they, 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 they uh, met them with uh, uh, revenge, and they wiped them out, really. How long did you live in Ramallah during the conflict? Oh, oh, so when the conflict started in 1948, it started in 1948, and I, I lived in Ramallah uh, uh, 1948. I lived in Ramallah, uh, I, was, uh, I was born in 1938, January of 38. So you're talking about what there's a, when that 38, uh, 48, I was 10 years old. You know, that's all. 38 to 48. And I, I remember that we used to go at the bottom, a bottom of the house there, under, under the first floor, to hide from the bombs that they were coming all over, over Ramallah. They used to send planes with thrown bombs. Yeah. Well, that's enough. <laughs> they scared the hell out of us. What, what can I tell you? And we don't have guns. We don't have nothing. We have no ammunition. We have no soldiers. You know, that's what happened. Okay. It continued. The conflict continued. And but when I when I graduated from college, uh, when I went to United States. Oh, you're talking about Ramallah. Ramallah. I I, I came here in 1948. Uh, 1938. I was born. 1963, I got married. No, that's when I went to America, 1963. My brother was there. And when I came to the train station, I didn't have a penny in my pocket to, make, to give him a call. I'm done. I just have the ticket from New York, from New York all the way to Detroit. So I waited, I waited about three, four hours trying to contact him. And somebody was going to help me with that. And I gave him the number instead of, inst he was dialing instead of uh, zero, O. Oh. And he would never get hold, he never get hold of my brother. So finally he changed, he realized that this could be zero. Called him, he told him, here's your brother, he's here. So my brother, he put him on the phone, he says, well listen, just take a cab and give him my address where I am and they'll bring you here. And God knows what he did. I don't know about it. Uh, he, uh, the cab driver, probably he went all over Ramallah so that he'll get more fees because it's on the clock, you know. So because I don't know where, where he's going, how did he go? It's only a uh, straight run all the way to my, uh, from uh, where my, uh, where my uh, brother lived and everything, you know. So I get, finally I got there. And when I got there, uh, it was snow about that high, and you know, I never seen snow in Ramallah, you know. <laughs> and uh, my brother, he, he prepared for me something to go and pedal, you know. That used to be the status. Suitcase, Milena, uh, babushkas, and bedspreads, and headscarves, and toilet. Uh, to to toilet is, you know, they put them in she's on the material it's, it's, uh, they do, do them by machine they put them design on the dressers and all that so and he told me how much to sell it for because he knows how much it costs when he bought it from downtown and I go there and my English was yucky yucky because I graduated from the friends boys school which it was American Quaker school you know private school and I learned few English, you know. And I said, can you take this and go and knock on the doors from here? And then when you finish that block, go there, down the other side, then go to another block and keep knocking at the door. I did that, but I froze. <laughs> I didn't have the right proper clothes with the snow, you know. And uh, I managed. The first day, in fact, he was happy with me. I sold and I made $60 profit <laughs> in one day. <laughs> so that's what happened. 
can we do to survive during the conflict here? Well, uh, the, the conflict, well, well, nothing really. We just uh, stayed, uh, stayed uh, in our home and, you know, we, we had our own house, you know, and we collected rent once in a while from the people who rented the stores. And we buy bulk things like wheat and we, my mother used to make uh, a zetun, and not in jars or anything, in a big container, zetun and buy oil in the tenaka, the whole can, and leave it in the house, and dukka zatar, I don't know if you know zatar, you know, ujibne, uh, ulebne, something like that. That's all. We have no farm to farm tomatoes and all that. So. Where did you go to school in Rwanda? France, uh, for the fourth grade, the government school, then after the fourth grade, I went to the French boys' school. Oh, I worked, uh, sure I worked. I, I worked selling once in a while. Sometimes I used to take the bus and go and drop in an area and I go and uh, start knocking doors, you know. And <clears throat> at one time my brother, he was working for Ford Motor Company. He happened to buy a, a little grocery store under the apartments, you know, like a basement. And uh, uh, I used to go and help him when he goes to the factory. Nobody used to uh, attend to the store. I used to go down there, you know, till maybe 10 o'clock at night or something. You know, and I, usually I have something to study and I couldn't make it. So I had to go home and wait till about 12, 1 o'clock, studying to finish my homework. Anyway. So anyhow, but the problem with that, I was there by myself one day and uh, three kids, punks, Abid, you know, I don't want to say the word, uh, uh, the bad word about them, the N word. Or oh, Avi, they came into the store, and one gun went all the way to the meat counter. One was walking, and the other one came to the candy counter, on the opposite side. And he goes and tell me, could you could you give me one piece of that? There was a box of candy way back there. I had to bend down all the way like that to reach it to get him. Once I did that, and that's all I remember. <laughs> Behind him used to have Nesbeth orange bottles, you know, drinks. He took that bottle and salakhni on, on my head. He had about 15, 16 stitches in hand and I was bleeding like hell. But I, 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 there was no damage, thank God, in the brains. It wasn't fractured. They took me to the hospital, and they checked it, x-rays and all, and they stitched it and let me go home. So, and I was unconscious till the next day in the evening. 24 hours, I was unconscious. Did, you steal, did they steal your money or what? No, they didn't steal nothing, really. What did they steal? Maybe a little uh, uh, lunch meat and what have you, you know, from the counter. Yeah, that's what we had to do. In the same store, in the same store, my, f my, my, f my brother was there in the meat counter and his wife was in the cashier in the front. Some four Abid came in and I don't know what they wanted. They wanted some money, they wanted some lunch meat, they wanted some, and punks, kids, not even some of them 18 years old. And uh, the neighbor upstairs, she knew us very well. And actually, she knew the kids. She looked through the window and she found out who are there. There was Rigamaroan, there's a gun. They, they went, I had one, they shot my, my, bro, uh, my, my brother right in the heart and he died. And then they shot on my sister-in-law while she's there, but they missed her on the, on the counter, on the cashier. So that's what happened. So they shipped him to the hospital, but he didn't make it, and he passed away. And then we had to clo close the store and uh, get rid of it because nobody could maintain it now. And it talking about problems and disasters and all that. Yeah, she, she came to, to America when she was four years old. She was born here in Ramallah, yes. She was seven years old when her father was in the army and the boat uh, landed in Haifa, Haifa, and on the Mediterranean there. And he made arrangements to tell her to come to Haifa so that he could take her back with him to America. 
And my wife was a, a young girl, about seven years old. So she was with her mother, and they just left Ramallah, and they jumped in the boat, army boat, and they went to, Ramallah, to America. And how did you meet her? Oh, I met her because I, she grew up to, to be a young lady, and she finished school, and she was sharp, and you know. And uh, one day we were over there, we were invited to a wedding, me and my brother and his wife and everything. And then her father, her mother, and she, they went to the wedding. And we had some cousins too, they were sitting next to us, you know. Abdel Noor, I don't know if you've heard him. Abdel Noor, he passed away. His wife is here now visiting. Anyhow, so I, I, I just finished college, I graduated and I have a student visa. So if I don't continue my education there, they're gonna deport me, take, because I have a student visa. They just put me in the boat, yalla, go back to your country. So, but uh, what I did, I figured if I get married here, I get to stay here, because she could make me a citizen after five years. I get the, the card, the green, green card is called. So that guy, when I heard, when I looked at her, I liked her. She's very nice, she looks neat, uh, you know, very, uh, she was raised right too. And so I told Abdel Noor, you like her? He, said, he jumped, he went to talk to her dad there. He says, listen, we have a boy, you know, our neighbor there, and he just graduated from college. You know, he's a nice, from a good family, and he's nice. And, you think you'll be able to uh, get him married to your daughter, yeah? So right away, because she was at the age of, really, he was about 24, I was 24 too, in a way, 24, 25. She says, well, why? There's no, no, no problem. If, if they like each other, that's fine. I, I accept it. So, <laughs> so, uh, so I, we, we went to their house, you know, a few people, and we sat down to meet to meet her and everything, to know that we're trying to not not la 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 ibn you know, like that. It's it's a habit, you know. So I get to know her. She was hiding a little bit, but we were talking in the kitchen, and they were talking about us. <laughs> and the, or, the, <laughs> I, I'm saying things that I shouldn't be saying. And actually, who liked me the most is her mother. She was a sweetheart. She loved me. <laughs> so, Kanata, and okay, yeah, that's fine. And we start seeing each other. We, we get engaged, but we can't get married because a lot of people died. When somebody dies from the family or something, we had to postpone the weddings, you know, for respect of the other family. So we did that. After six months, we got married, and uh, we became man and wife. I had a job, you know, in the engineering field, you know, supervisor and we, uh, working for a gas company that lays uh, pipes in the ground and, and they put, uh, uh, you know, the SIAM to find out the, cons the consumption of gas and everything so that they send bills. So I did that, in fact, uh, I went to the Upper Peninsula, they didn't have gas at all, and I, I, I did the whole project, you know, mains, regulators, gas, for the whole village, you know. We, we, and it was nothing but rocks. We had to blow the rocks to get the pipeline under the rocks. But we finished, it was six months uh, project. At that time she was, she got pregnant, and uh, so she moved she moved to her parents' house, take care of her, and uh, we rented the house for about two, three months for a, uh, for a uh, baseball player. He used to come and he brought his wife and kids, one kid, to go and, and live in my house for rent, you know, just to help out a little bit. So that's what happened. When did you get married and where? I got married in Detroit and one in about 1963. We got married and we had to go to the honeymoon. Huh? So we arranged to go to, uh, what do you call it, uh, down the islands uh, by Florida, south of Florida there. Uh, Caribbean? Uh, huh? Caribbean? 
not the Caribbean, some island, uh, I don't know, I forget the name over there. Yeah, some island, it's nice. And so we went there and uh, we, we, we got the honeymoon, the honeymoon uh, room, you know, and uh, we go in there. You know, when we first get married, we're all excited and bashful and, you know, so, so we're not used to this uh, hanky-panky, you know. And, and then uh, there was a bottle of, uh, uh, some kind of a bottle, uh, they make it over there cheap. So I was, you know, I was stretching like this all the time, I dropped it and it's all over the floor, <laughs> busted. <laughs> so we, we had somebody to come and clean it up. We don't want to drink that, then, yeah. Um, what is your occupation and what is your wife's occupation? My wife, uh, she was working secretary for uh, insurance people, uh, a bus downtown. She used to be the secretary, typist and all that for a while when I first married her. Uh, and uh, she used to, uh, her father bought her a grocery store to be partner with his cousin because he can't make it himself, so. And what else did she do? That's about it. Then when I became a State Farm agent, she used to help me. She come to the office and ex-date. Ex-date means she goes and calls the people and tell them uh, her name, uh, a State Farm agent is going to save you some money, your car insurance, and save you some money, your home insurance. When, do, when does it renew so that I could remind you that he's coming to see you? So they give her the, the, the X date, it's called. So I have to accumulate about 1,000 X days before I get into that insurance business. I was an insurance agent for 20, 21 years. And I worked as an engineer for 20 years. How many children do you have? Four, two girls and two boys. Um, tell us about leaving Romamba for the US. When did you leave? What mode of transportation did you take? How was the journey? Who did you travel with? I traveled on a, on a boat. We couldn't afford to take a flight train. We went to, on a, a Greek boat. It took about 19 days in the ocean. And uh, it was fun for me. I, know I, never, uh, I never fainted or like that because a lot of people, they vomit and they don't go to dinner. I enjoyed it myself. And when we got there to Halifax, from Halifax, the ship came down to New York, and we got out. We, we took the, they sent us to the train station, take the train to Detroit. And who did you travel with? Nobody, by myself. They were all uh, Greeks, some, some, some Arab uh, women too, with her kids. You know, I don't know them, I mean, but it was all kinds of people in that boat. How old were you? Hmm. You know, how old are you when I, when I came to the United States? Uh, oh my God, now you got me, I had to figure it out. Well, I came here before I, I got my education. I was, uh, I was only what? Uh, I was uh, 24, uh, it was about five years after, after, after I finished uh, the high school. That's when I traveled. I, I, when I was, I was 1957 when I, yeah, so I figured it out. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know math now. <laughs> that was my uh, best subject, math, physics, chemistry, and all that. I excelled in that. <laughs> Describe your feeling the first time you landed in the U.S. I told you, when I landed, I landed in Detroit with snow. I hated it, I froze, and I made $60 for my, for my brother, and he was happy with me, so. And uh, I started looking at the trees, see if there's any money, you know, but uh, they said money grows in trees over there, so <laughs> I didn't see no money. <laughs> uh, were your children born in the U.S.? Yes, all four of them. Oh, well, I spoke English. I learned it too when I came to college. They gave me 101 English course and all that. And I learned it 
more. I know a little about it, but I learned more. And uh, that's what happened. And, and the kids, I, I, I taught until they finished colleges, all four of them, two master's degree and two doctors. I helped them out and opened offices for them. And yeah, they all what to do. They get married, they get homes, they get kids. I got eight grandchildren and uh, the two girls and the two boys, the two doctors. Oh, it was easy. I mean, it doesn't bother me. And I used to talk to a lot of people when I go from door to door. And uh, uh, I, uh, in fact, one day uh, <coughs> I, I was in the cold snow. I was knocking on the door. There was two old ladies there. One of the ladies, her son, went to the army. Her only son, you know. And she invited me in, you know. And they were so kind, so nice, you know. And they, 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 they cooked, they heated some soup, and they gave me a bowl of soup, and they saw what I'm selling, and they bought something to help me out. And from that moment, we became friends, you know? I used to visit her. In fact, we used to have apartment rented the street behind her, you know, another street. And I get used to her, and I used to go and visit her all the time for poor thing. One day she liked me, she says, listen, uh, here's my credit card. I want you to go to Hudson and buy yourself a suit. And don't worry about what it is. So I, I don't want to go and do that. And I went, I, I, I found a suit very thin, the cheapest suit they had. So I picked it up, you know, uh, to you, you use it once in a while. You know, I, I was a beggar. <laughs> The neighbors were Jewish uh, upstairs from the apartment. They were Jewish, yeah. They, they're good. Yeah, they were good. We were friends and everything, no problems. Yeah. <clears throat> when, when I was peddling, though, they used to have, uh, when I ring the bell, they have something opening about that big, above the bell, you know. And a lady goes in her book uh, upstairs, you know. Who's this? So, it's me, Fred. <laughs> the voice coming from someplace. I don't know what's coming from that hole. But then I don't listen. I said, oh, she doesn't hear me. And then I said, who's this thing? It's me, Fred. So I said, where the hell is the voice coming from? So I go to the end of the porch to look upstairs to see if I could see somebody <laughs> upstairs doing it. So I was, you know, but anyhow, finally, uh, she says, no, I don't need nothing. So I took off. They're all in the U.S. now, the immediate family. But, uh, you know, actually, there's a few distant family there left. That's all. Since immigrating to the U.S., have you traveled back to Ramallah? If so, how and when often? I never did. The only time I came to Ramallah, me and my wife, was the last convention 40 years ago. And now my wife is not there. I came by myself to the second convention. Describe what? How Ramallah feels to you since leaving. Since leaving? Oh, Ramallah, Ramallah, I don't know Ramallah. I, 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 I can't, I couldn't even find where my house is. I didn't even know where the church is. I didn't know where my school is, the friend's boy's school. I, I, I mean, the streets are different. The, the buildings all over the place. And that's all you see, buildings. I went to the 17th floor from a hotel. I looked around, and in fact, I took a picture of all the high-rises from one end all the way. I moved around. It's all nothing but high-rise building. Nothing else. That's all you see. I haven't seen a swimming pool there, like, you know, in the front, in back of the house or anything like that. But that's what it is. It's, it's developed. It's growing bad and fast. And uh, there's more people coming into Ramallah. And they're doing a lot of building in Ramallah. And it's, it's, it's amazing what happened to Ramallah. 
I mean, it's expanded. They, they dig the mountains to build homes. They dig the mountains. Half of the mountain, they take it out so that they build the high rise. Here? No, we, we don't get in touch with them. Nobody's here that we go in touch with, really. What are your thoughts about Ramallah now? You answered it. What are your thoughts about uh, what's happening with Jerusalem? It's bad. Everybody, all countries, they hate it from the news and everything, from what I could gather, because, you know, that's not right. Even the Jews themselves, they denied that. They should do that. They shouldn't have an embassy. They shouldn't have a nation. They shouldn't have a country because the Jews are a religion. It's a religion. It's not people. And even the Jews themselves, they keep preaching all over. I hear it in Facebook. I hear it in all over from, from, uh, uh, from New York and from other places. These are the... the, 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 the you know, the, what do you call them? Uh, part, part Jewish, though, they, they, they hate that. They don't like it. They don't, want, they don't want a country. Yeah. Do you think you will see peace in your lifetime? I hope so. That's all. I mean, I'm, I'm getting old, but I hope so. I hope they'll have peace. We, it was very peaceful here before, before the Zionists moved in. The Zionists is ruined the whole thing for the, the, Jew, the Jewish. They still are doing it for that expansion and all that. So uh, that's, that's what it is. It's, uh, it's a shame that they can't get together because we used to live together all the time. My passport, no, my birth certificate, it's in three languages, Arabic, Jewish, and English, believe it or not. My passport, when I made it, I filled it up, I was born in Palestine. It's right there. Do you still have it? Oh, sure, I still have it. I just renewed it, too. Um, what are you doing to help the peace process? Well, I involved in a lot of organizations. Uh, like, uh, I, I, we publish a magazine, Hadi Here Ramallah magazine. I don't know if you've heard of it. For the last 52 years, we've been publishing it. It's about 36 pages. Every two months, we send it to all Ramallah people. In fact, we send copies here to, to Ramallah from the magazine. We have the people who die, who get born, the little kids, some articles about the policy or what's happening and everything, like a newspaper, you know, and uh, articles, and, and, and it's very, Nice magazine to read. I think, uh, I don't know where you could read it now. They use it in university or in the schools. And uh, we send a few copies. They used to copy it here. We send them the, the mission, the cover, but they're going to go back and to copy in so many copies for the, uh, the people in Ramallah, I hope. So I was uh, every position in that magazine. For the last 52 years, I'm still doing it. And then I, I joined the, the organization, Ramallah Club of Detroit. We have about uh, so many clubs all over the big cities. That's what makes the federation. That's what makes the convention. That's what makes our book. We have a, we renew it every seven, eight years. The address book for everybody in Ramallah and their wives and their phone number and what city they live in and everything. About that thing, you see? So we were very active. It started with about five, three, four kids that came to, univer to the university, uh, Wayne University. They started to publish a magazine, Hadi Ramallah, and start making distribution. And some rich people from Ramallah, they gave a few dollars to start. You know. And we grew now, and we started sending 36 issues, beautiful, the paper, the printing, in English and Arabic. That's what we do, too. And now we start making conventions here, which is nice. I like that. Yeah. And what are you doing in support of the Palestinians? Well, always any, any activity, we join it. And we, we are active in uh, making, raising some money for the cause and everything, for the various organizations. But it, it gets to be uh, handsome for 
money. A little money is not going to do anything. It's, we need the publicity. We have to let the people know how we stand and what uh, the Israelis is all about and all that. But we don't have that. Not like the Jews. They're so active in that. <clears throat> and our kids now we have to really teach them, bring them here for visits and, and let them work here for a while. You know, we have that, but not enough. One time they, we bring about 30 kids, girls or boys together, and they come in and uh, they do improvements in, in, in Ramallah. Is there anything else you want, you would like to add? Uh, no, nothing. I, I said it all. Now you know more about me than I am. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any stories about when you were a child in Ramallah? Do you have any hmm. stories while you were living through the intifadas and the war? Um, yeah, I was living, but I think my mother keeps telling me she came here and she passed away anyhow. She says, you know, when you were born, Habibi, you were, you were the prettiest baby ever. You were just like a little lamb, plum and healthy and everything. The nurse who used to t take us to the nurse in the municipality, there's an office. He says, oh, what a beautiful baby. <laughs> she was proud of that. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> I'm the only one who went to college for my brothers and sisters. Some of them didn't even finish high school. I'm the only one that continued my education and become an engineer and, and succeeded in life a little bit. Now I'm trying to help my kids to do the same thing, you know, and uh, encourage them to be independent and everything. But they're doing good, thank God. Can't complain. Is there any story that happened to you while you were here? that you will never forget? No, not really. Well, yeah, well, uh, in the French boys' school, I was excelled. I used to be the first in the class, you know? And uh, we have a sports group, the Bears, the Lions, this and thing. Our Bears wear the black shirt. And we used to compete with each other, these groups, or other schools, something, play soccer, or yani football, you know, they call it soccer. And uh, I used to be the captain. Because of my grades and everything, they put me as a captain with the Bears, because every group, they have a captain. So that made me happy a little bit, you know. 